Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Optimizing Cytokine Analysis, Choosing the Right Assay for Accurate Detection and Interpretation of Cytokine Expression. I am Sydney McNeil of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Biotechni. To learn more, visit www.bio-techni.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain your credits. I would like to now welcome our speaker, Laura Hokum Stone, Senior Research Associate, Non-Clinical Applications Specialist, Preclinical Research Center, University of Minnesota, and Scott Hunter Oppler, PhDC, DVMC, Preclinical Research Center, Department of Surgery, University of Minnesota. Laura, Scott, you may now begin your presentation. Good morning. Today we'd like to talk to you about the importance of cytokine analysis and preclinical research, specifically the impact of assay choice and study design on accurate interpretation of cytokine results. My colleague Scott and I are your speakers today. We're both part of the Preclinical Research Center at the University of Minnesota within the Department of Surgery, directed by Dr. Melanie Graham. Our center focuses on developing methods to understand immunometabolism towards innovative therapies for diseases with high public health impact, such as diabetes, obesity, and infectious disease. We are also interested in identifying the general reasons why animal models often fail to predict human outcomes and as well as providing solutions to improve the accuracy of these models and animal welfare. I personally specialize in the development of in vitro applications to support our work, including assay characterization, development, and optimization, as well as enhancing translatability of preclinical research to clinical applications. Over the course of this talk, you should be able to understand the elements of preclinical assay qualification, describe how study-imposed variables may unintentionally impact cytokine expression, recognize the utility of multiplex cytokine analysis in preclinical research applications, as well as learning what attributes to look for in choosing the right cytokine assay. Cytokines are a common analyte of interest in preclinical research. This is because they are critical regulators of inflammation and immunity. They are indicators of health status, disease progression, as well as monitoring treatment efficacy. Cytokines transmit intercellular signals that are central to immune homeostasis, and they play a central role in the pathologies of many diseases. Cytokine response is a target for immune manipulation, such as in the instance of solid organ transplantation. And they're a very attractive target for research due to their accessibility. They're highly abundant in circulating blood, so they can be sampled during minimally invasive blood draws throughout a study. When you decide to incorporate cytokine analysis into your research, it is important to consider the pros and cons of commercially available kits for cytokine detection. First, you need to determine what is gonna be fit for purpose given your experimental model and your experimental design. Some of the things to consider are your sample type, Will you be studying a blood product such as serum or plasma or something a bit more complex and harder to get such as cerebrospinal fluid, saliva, or urine? Sample volume is also important. Is this something you have in abundance or is it something you need to take great care to conserve? Another important thing to think about is whether you're interested in looking at pathway analysis or some single or just a few targeted analytes. If you already know which cytokines you're interested in, you might only want to run an assay on just a small handful of cytokines rather than wanting to multiplex and look at um, multiple cytokines on a pathway level for your analysis. You should also consider whether you'll be running in-phase or batched analysis. 
in phase is where you would be running a small number of samples that you collect in phase along with your study versus batch analysis where you collect throughout the study and then you save the samples to be run in a large batch at the end. You also should think about your anticipated de detection range, which I know can be difficult in a lot of experimental models, but you should be able to predict whether or not you expect to see high levels of inflammation and therefore high levels of circulating cytokines, or if you think these levels will be rather low and sensitivity is gonna be very important for you. Once you've considered these elements, you can decide which type of tests and methodologies you'd like to employ to detect cytokines for your research. As I said before, if you're interested in a few targeted analytes, a single analyte ELISA might be a good choice for you. These are commonly run um, using capture antibodies on a, on a coated plate. Um, but if you wanna look at a large number of cytokines, you don't wanna do this with multiple single analyte tests because it will use a lot of time and a lot of sample volume. So if you're interested in uh, either a screening assay or looking at a large pathway level analysis, I'd recommend using multiplex cytokine analysis. This is typically done with coated beads that can also have capture antibodies on them and can measure multiple analytes at once. You know, the other thing to consider with multiplexing is that in some cases you do sacrifice some sensitivity when you multiplex multiple analytes. So you'll have to look into what type of sensitivity you need for each of them. In our center, um, we use multiplexing analysis for our cytokine research, and we do this using XMAP technology from LumenX. XMAP is, stands for Unknown Multi-Analyte Profiling, and is comprised of four basic components. These include biological reagents, so these are the capture antibodies, microspheres, which the capture antibodies are bound to and are co-incubated with your sample, specific detection instruments for detecting your sample, as well as dedicated software for the acquisition and analysis of your cytokine data. XMAP works using microspheres, as I mentioned before. So these are small beads that are coated with magnetic particles, and they um, are able to have multiple binding sites on each bead so they can detect multiple analytes. Um, the magnetic particles allow you to use magnetic separation, which is really nice because it eliminates the need for filter plates or complicated washing steps. You can just use a magnet to um, draw your magnetic beads to the bottom and just dump off your washing buffer when you do your washing steps. So it's really convenient. When you use this type of technology with the Luminex multiplex assays, the way it works is that two fluorophores are mixed at different ratios to, keep, to create unique spectral addresses. Each bead color is then assigned an analyte to measure in the assay's reactions, and each reaction measures multiple analytes in one sample. To do this, your first step is to co-incubate your sample with your bead cocktail, where your sample will then bind with the capture analytes. Next, you need to be able to detect your bound analytes. So you'll co-incubate your bound sample with a detection antibody, which in this case is a biotinylated analyte-specific detention detection antibody, which will sandwich with the analyte of interest. Following a wash, you'll add streptavidin PE, um, which will bind to the biotinylated antibody and allow for detection. Finally, you will measure your bound analytes using a dual laser flow-based instrument. Examples of these include a Luminex 1 or 200, a FlexMap 3D, or a BioRed BioPlex instrument. These work similar to a flow cytometer where your sample will be drawn up in a single column and interrogated by the two lasers. In this case, one laser will interrogate the label to quantify the number of binding events, and the other laser will interrogate the bead with the red laser to identify the bead region based on your internal dye concentrations. Next, I'd like to talk about how we use cytokines in preclinical research. Preclinical research is comprised of a breadth of different experimental models from in vitro to small animal to large animal. When your research question is interested in phase validity, it commonly uses something like an in vitro or in silico model. These are models that will capture a similar physiology or phenomenon that you're trying to capture, um, such as hyperglycemia or glucose intolerance. And these are typically done with cells in a dish 
or computer models. Next, if you want to look at construct validity, um, you'll want a model that has similar underlying biology to look at the etiology of the disease. Um, these are commonly done with small animal models, such as mice and rats, as well as certain large animal models, such as sheep and pigs. However, these models often fail to translate directly to the clinic because there are too many differences between them and humans. When you want to look at predictive validity, so you want to look at how well your model will respond to a clinically effective intervention or therapeutic agent in the same way that a human would, um, that's when we want to bring in our large animal models, which in our case is not human primates. We take great care to choose the correct animal model for any of our studies, and we specialize in working with primates. And the reason we do this, while in vitro and rodent studies generally support really important work with pathway determination and mechanistic studies, NHPs are used to examine practicality, safety, and generalized efficacy with high relevance to the clinic. The reason this, these animals work so well is due to their close genetic relationship with humans. They have close similarity anatomically, behaviorally, developmentally, physiologically, and in reproductively. They also have a complex immune system that is very close to humans, including conservation of MHC expression. These animals also have cross-reactivity with many human-directed biologicals. So in many cases, we can use the same uh, reagents that we would in a human trial with these animals. They're also susceptible to viral infections. Um, so that can be helpful in these studies. And all of these things together allow us to create clinical trial-like preclinical safety and efficacy studies that allow us to parallel elaborate therapies and outcome measures for improved translatability into the clinic. Given the importance of our samples um, and of our animals, I would like to talk about how we can implement cytokine analysis while keeping in mind scientific rigor and reproducibility. In our case, um, we commonly do cytokine analysis. And in order to do this, we wanna make sure we have an assay that works well and that we can interpret accurately. So we validated a commercial multiplex cytokine assay. And we did this by collecting serum samples from 20 naive cinemalgus macaques and we validated this assay across four separate plates. Assay validation is comprised of four major components, the first of which is recovery. And this is defined as uh, measuring the observed concentration of an analyte relative to the expected concentration. We did this by creating eight unique serum sample pools made from a single animal. And each sample that was then measured neat, spiked with the kit provided highest standard, and spiked with a kit provided mid-range standard. Our acceptance criteria was recovery of between 70 to 125% of the expected value. And with that criteria, 13 of the 23 cytokines passed. Next, we looked at linearity, which is defined as the observed concentration relative to expected concentration in a sample with a known dilution. So we spiked our serum with the highest concentration kit standard and measured it neat and also diluted at a one to two dilution and a one to five dilution. Again, our acceptance criteria was 70 to 125% recovery of our diluted samples. And with this criteria, 14 of the 23 cytokines passed. Next, we looked at precision, uh, both intra and inter assay precision. And to do this, we pooled serum spiked with both mid and high range standards, and we measured these across four assay plates. Our acceptance criteria was to have CVs that fell below 25% for inter-assay precision and below 20% for intra-assay precision. All of our analytes passed except for TNF-alpha inter-assay. Finally, we looked at sensitivity, which is the ability of the kit to detect low range concentrations of analytes. To do this, we took the lowest kit provided standard and diluted it at one to two and one to four to determine the lower limit of detection and the lower limit of quantitation. Our acceptance criteria was that the lower limit of detection was less than or equal to the lowest kit provided standard concentration. And with this criteria, all 23 cytokines passed. When you take these four elements together, you can create validation uh, criteria 
for your assay. From this 23 plex assay, um, all, 11 of the 23 cytokines met all of our acceptance criteria, seven were rejected, and five passed three, but not all four of our criteria, so we considered them marginal. And all of this helps us to interpret our results as we go through with our experiments. So given that criteria in mind, um, we wanted to look at how, um, how within subject variability looked with this assay. We did this by measuring cytokine values in repeated sampling from the same subject on different days. And as you can see here, there's a number of cytokines that have really high variability. But if you look back at our acceptance criteria, you will find that the cytokines that have these really high variabilities correspond to our rejected validation outcomes. So since we've done that work, we now won't accidentally ascribe a cytokine value to being due to experimental effect when in fact it's due to poor assay performance. So the kid I was just talking about um, overall after our validation has about 40% of the analytes falling within detection range for us. And interassay CVs that are within 5% are about 39% of the analytes. So this is one that we were using a number of years ago. A couple years ago, R&D systems approached us to test their kit that had more analytes and was made for NHPs. And we were interested in this. So initially we ran a kit and followed the manufacturer's SOP. And again, we only had about 40% of analytes falling within the detection range, but we had really nice CVs. 88% fell within 5%. We then partnered with R&D scientists to be able to optimize the assay performance. And after working with them for a while, we found that we could increase the incubation time with the sample to improve binding. And we were able to do this without increasing noise in the assay. And we also expanded the number of points on the standard curve to improve the accuracy of lower concentration analytes. After working with these scientists and optimizing the assay, we now have an assay with 83% of analytes falling within the detection range and 97.2% of analytes having inner assay CVs falling within 5%, which is really exceptional for a multiplex assay like this. So it's with these partnerships that we can really optimize these to work for our specific application and our specific samples so that we can have really reliable data. Now that we've gone through validation of an assay and elements that go into choosing the right assay for your cytokine analysis, it's important to consider intrinsic variables that can influence your scientific outcomes. In this case, we're of course talking about cytokine expression. With animal models, these intrinsic variables are demographic based. So these can include species. Um, our center works typically with two species of NHPs. These are cinemalgus and rhesus macaques. And through our work, we have found that both of these species have different baseline uh, cytokine expression. So it's important to not just compare between species, but think about which ones are included in your, um, in your work. Next, we want to look at origin. So our NHPs are outbred. And so they have a lot higher variability in cytokine expression and genetic expression as compared to a rodent model, which is inbred for a very specific genetic profile. One of the most important things to think about is the sex of your animals and having a balanced cohort, if at all possible, in your research. Um, as many of you know, both preclinical and clinical studies are male skewed, and this has had a negative impact on just our interpretation of a lot of diseases and therapies. Um, and so to illustrate that a little bit more, we looked at the difference in cytokine expression in our cinemalgus macaques between males and females. And you can see that there were many um, pro-inflammatory cytokines that had a significant difference between the sexes, including IL-6, IL-8, and IL-15. There were also major anti-inflammatory cytokines, such as IL-4, IL-10, and CD40 ligand, which were significantly different between the sexes, as well as TGF-alpha and IL-5, which are involved in wound healing and other roles. Next, we'd like to talk to you about model-imposed variables that can impact your cytokine expression. And for that, I will hand it over to my colleague, Scott. Thanks, Laura. 
Hi everyone, my name is Scott Oppler and I'm a current graduate student at the University of Minnesota's College of Veterinary Medicine, where my research focuses on enhancing scientific rigor towards improved clinical translation, as well as improved animal welfare. In addition to some of these intrinsic factors that can affect study results, there are a range of model imposed variables that can unintentionally influence important scientific outcome measures as well. Certain characteristics of the lab setting, such as how animals are handled, the severity of the conditions they experience, and both their physical and social environments, may expose animals to conditions different from the clinical setting. Ultimately, these types of variables can all have downstream effects on an animal's stress state, which has been shown to have profound influences on a number of physiological systems. Taking a closer look at the possible effects of handling, it has been shown that restraint is capable of inducing stress that can affect numerous aspects of physiology, including the immune system, in addition to having direct drug-related effects introduced by chemical-based restraint. In the example presented here, an animal experiences restraint-based sampling and as a result has a stress response and an activation of the HPA axis. This can lead to changes in vital measurements and changes in the immune system, including changes in inflammatory state, antibody production, cytokine expression, and immune cell distribution throughout the body. In such cases, it may become difficult or even impossible to discern what aspects of physiological status may be attributed to a test article or disease state being studied versus what may be due, at least in part, to an unintentionally induced stress response. The two most common types of handling used in non-human primate research include restraint-based handling and cooperative handling. Restraint-based handling is the most commonly used type of handling and in many cases is required by the FDA in preclinical studies. Um, restraint-based handling can include sedation or physical restraint such as chair restraint and, has the, and is less representative of the clinical situation and has the potential for stress or chemical confounding of outcome measures. On the other hand, the less commonly used cooperative handling, cooperative based handling is widely implemented at our center and involves training animals to actively participate in as aspects of their own care. Following successful training, animals develop a comfort level with handlers and can participate in certain activities such as voluntary limb presentation for blood sampling and drug administration. In many cases, these animals learn to not only tolerate and participate in these activities, but some develop an actual appreciation and looking forward to such events as an opportunity to earn treats and an opportunity to experience an enriching activity. Um, importantly, this type of handling is more representative of the clinical situation and has um, the less potential for confounding of important outcome measures. Um, to initially assess the differential effects of handling method on one aspect of physiology, we retrospectively analyzed differences in serum cytokine expression from samples we had previously collected from naive healthy animals, either cooperatively or sedated. In these figures, the red bars represent cooperatively handled animals, while the yellow bars represent ketamine sedated animals. Our analysis revealed a widespread blunting effect by sedation on overall cytokine expression. Um, the blunting of multiple cytokines from shared physiological pathways, such as IL-1223, IFN gamma, and IL-2, suggests a general systemic effect of sedation on cytokine expression. Um, this can have significant implications for studies that rely on assessing changes in immune response, as it may potentially either hide or overpower any changes that are actually occurring and during study interpretation. It's important to note that these findings were from a one-time sampling and handling, handling event, whereas many other preclinical studies require much more intensive and frequent handling in order to perform required sampling, dosing, physical examination, or disease management. Some examples of these kinds of studies include 42-day safety and efficacy studies, 24-hour pharmacokinetic studies, and even routine disease management over a much longer period of time. For one example, um, a diabetic model of non a non-human primate diabetic model may undergo a minimal bi-daily sampling for blood glucose measurements and insulin administration, in addition to more regular blood sampling at different intervals. As a result, 
We wanted to investigate the effects of cooperative handling versus restraint-based handling in the context of an intensive handling and sampling schedule that was representative of a typical safety and efficacy study. To do so, we divided a total of 12 young adult non-human primates into cooperative or chemical-based restraint sampling groups and allowed them to follow an identical sampling timeline representative of a typical safety and efficacy sampling scheme. Um, animals were sampled initially multiple times a week, followed by less frequent regularly sampling for the duration of the study. Physiological changes and adverse events were monitored for the, monitored for the duration of the study and then were compared across cohorts. The first thing that we found was that chemical restraint led to an increased incidence of adverse events. The incidence of both vomiting and nausea and appetence were significantly greater in animals sampled under chemical restraint compared to those sampled cooperatively. An increase in adverse events has major scientific implications and highlights the impact of handling technique on animal welfare. An increase in handling-related adverse events may complicate study outcome interpretation, making it difficult to distinguish intervention-related events from those caused by handling technique. And these events themselves may even alter therapeutic efficacy. To take a closer look at the physiologic influences of intensive handling technique, we compared serum cytokine expression across the cohorts and found that chemical restraint-based sampling resulted in longitudinal changes in cytokine expression. In the figures presented here, the yellow bars represent cooperatively sampled animals and the red bars represent sedated animals. Um, on days 0, 7, 21, and 42 across the study. Um, we found that expression of several pro-inflammatory cytokines showed significant increases over time in the frequently sedated sampling cohort, yet remained relatively stable over the same time period in the cooperative cohort. Um, once again, similar to before, these apparent effects of frequent restraint-based handling may complicate study interpretation by making it difficult to distinguish test article or disease-related changes from unintentionally provoked physiological changes, again, providing an example of how one model-imposed variable can influence scientific outcomes. In conclusion, cytokines are a valuable tool for preclinical research that can provide insight into changes in health and disease status, as well as therapeutic response. Adding to this value, multiplexing cytokine analysis provides the opportunity to reduce sampling requirements and animal numbers used in scientific studies. It provides the opportunity for pathway level analysis of health status and disease progression. To maximize the value that these assays can provide, qualification and optimization of any commercial kit is critical as it increases translational accuracy of our studies. Um, sharing refinements via open access publications can lead to improved science from studies performed across the world. Um, finally, understanding experimental variables, both intrinsic and model imposed, and how they impact cytokine expression are critical for accurate interpretation of study results. We'd like to take a moment to thank everyone who has made all of this work possible, especially including our animals used in these studies, in addition to the incredible staff and students at the Preclinical Research Center, as well as our numerous partner labs and institutions who contribute to this work every day. Um, thanks everyone for listening and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Laura and Scott for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, what clinical applications are there for multiplex cytokine analysis? Hi. Um, when it comes to clinical applications for this type of multiplexing, um, it's probably not the most practical for, you know, a regular um, surveillance assay that you do with patients. But where it does come in handy is um, as a screening assay for clinical trials and development. Um, so. They can be really a good way if they're done appropriately, sort of how we outlined in this talk, to give you really accurate data to select a few biomarkers or analytes of interest that you'd want to monitor, monitor clinically. Perfect. Thank you. Our next question is, 
how can small labs easily implement assay validation? Um, yeah, happy to answer that. Um, sometimes this work can look a bit daunting, especially if you're a smaller operation. Um, but the nice thing is, is if depending on the type of work you're doing, whether if it's not regulatory, um, and what you're really concerned about is just getting the best data possible from your assay, you can modify sort of what we've outlined by thinking about what your critical endpoints are and what's most important to you um, for how the assay runs. And you can do this by running a single assay with um, some previously banked samples that you know will be have low concentrations and then maybe your disease state or your treatment state that will have higher concentrations. You can get a feel for how the assay runs at different ends of the spectrum um, and look at sort of your CVs and your detection ability. Perfect, thank you. It looks like we have one final question. How do you know that the changes observed in cytokine expression is due to restraint-induced stress rather than interference from sedative agents in the assay? Great, so um, after our initial findings related to the effects of one-time sedated sampling on cytokine expression, we thought it was important to make sure that our results were not just a direct result of ketamine-related interference with assay performance. Um, to do this, we collected new samples from several cooperatively handled cinnamogus macaques and measured cytokine expression from these samples, both neat and spiked with ketamine, um, from which we found no significant differences, suggesting that these observed changes were likely not due to ketamine, um, direct ketamine effects or interference with the assay itself, but rather some sort of um, physiological effects. Perfect, thank you. All right, we, it actually looks like we have one final question that came through. Can we extend the result you got from primate to rodent model in case of restrained and cooperative sampling? I think you can to a certain extent. Um, well, the responses won't be the same. I think it's it's safe to say that um, rodents will likely have an effect on cytokine expression due to stress from either handling if they aren't acclimated to their handlers or repeated sampling or repeated sedation. Um, well, very likely those effects will extend to rodents, but they might not be exactly the same. Perfect, thank you so much. All right, thank you again, Laura and Scott, for your time today and for your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, and our sponsor Biotechni, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.